So, tonight we're going to cover some internal struggles that we face every day. That's right. So, in, internal conflict, right, usually take place between what we want versus what we have to do. For example, cleaning your dishes. Is it like you're looking at the sink? Nah, I'll do it tomorrow. Hey, come on. That's at work. What? Uh, oh, I know I'm a Christian. I should initiate with this new coworker, but I'm just too shy. But with your friends, I know to bring up something with this uh, with my mate. But I just I feel like if I bring this up, this guy's gonna hate me. But sometimes I don't want to be a hypocrite. Well, when you evangelize, when the Holy Spirit tells you, go share with this guy. I said, oh, let me, let me just like, send this text uh, with the um, person I met previously. And then you ended up just like, dang, like, I'm such a coward. Why something goes where you procrastinate when you're dealing with your failures? That's just because there's too many gods, so many voices within your head. <coughs> Have you seen the movie Inside Out? Yeah. 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 So it's like a movie about like all different types of emotions taking control within a person's head, right? So like, just like clearly that person didn't, doesn't even know who she listened to, and just ended up choosing anger to deal with everything. Yes. End up such a mess, all right? We listen to so many different voices coming from our emotions, True. desires, other people's comments about you, or about the things that you love. Slanders. You care about all those words, uh, all those voices, other than God's voice. We need to hear only one voice and one and follow one God. As in First Timothy chapter two, verse five, it says, "For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus needs to be our Lord. Yeah. Even needs to be the Lord of all those many voices in your head." Yeah. Point number one. It's not all about you, hey. all right? Stop making anything about yourself. Hey. Let's look, let's cover some, uh, the source, let's find a source of conflict, all right? James chapter four, verse one to three. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the, your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You cover, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you, you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because, because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on what you pleasure, or on your pleasures. So James is here talking to his church. Guys, are you guys fighting just because simply you only care about what you want? You, some of you even trying to kill for something that you desire for so long. Right, and yeah, the correct way is to pray to God. You ask God for it, but again, you don't ask with the wrong, uh, with the right motive. Right? Because you're simply making everything about yourself. It, it, it takes, for any quarrels and fights, it takes two palms to make one clap. It only takes one humble person to maintain peace. Right? Have you ever tried to uh, pick a fight with a humble uh, brother and sister at the church? Yeah? You end up feeling so bad about yourself, right? Yeah? You, even, you even end up feeling worse. You feel like, oh, I'm such a sinner. Right? With our desires, it is either that we let go of it or let God do it. When it comes to our desires that are selfish and evil, that's when we need to let it go. As, in, uh, says, uh, as Jesus says in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. All right, like, but some desires, yes, it's not bad to have desires. Some desires are good. But those are exactly those moments you need to ask God. You need to ask God to deliver it for you instead of you trying to manipulate manipulate the circumstances on your own out of your own strength to try to get it. Well, well I appreciate Hannah. Right? Um, as you guys know, when, uh, two day, two Sundays ago, I think, yeah, uh, she shared on her communion about like uh, she didn't get chosen on her um, placement uh, in her nursing degree. But I, I assume, um, I guess, like there must be some negative emotions going on in her heart she has to deal with. But as you guys have heard on Sunday, what she shared 
She just like uh, just surrendered, totally surrendered to God, surrendered, surrendered to God. She left her faith. My faith, let alone God decided. Right? And God came through and delivered to her. Two days later, she received a phone call and telling her that, hey, actually, we're willing to give you a second chance. Yeah. Now she's on her second try, going, uh, getting, uh, getting for her um, Come placement. Come on. And that's from God, by simply surrendering mm. her, um, her, her own will. Come on. So you've got to choose a side. James chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means that? Uh, enmity against God therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God yeah. or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us but he gives us more grace that's that is why scripture uh, scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble so making friends with with the world you are going against God because the value that the world is trying to feed you is so different than God. Right. It says, as it says in Matthew 25, 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The difference between heaven and hell. And here James calls like us, the readers, not just his, uh, people in his church, we're spiritual prostitutes. Right? This, this is to tell us like when, this is exactly who we are when we be unfaithful to God. When we choose to align our loyalty with the world. But this actually triggers a lot of prideful people. Are you triggered tonight? If you are, that's good. Because like even Martin Luther, Martin Luther even wanted to remove James from the Bible. That's how triggered he was. Well, as the Bible warned us this, 2 Timothy verse 3, one, uh, verse 1 to 5. But mark this, there will be a terrible time in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of money boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to, the par- to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of the pleasure rather than lover- lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Having have nothing to do with such people. So you get to see all of the above are mentioned on YouTube and TV nowadays. You know those top G motivational videos? These muscle, mus, uh, muscular guys are like, telling you that you're missing out on chance of like earning big bucks. <laughs> all right. Well, like, we are in those terrible times. Look at the people around you. Look at ourselves have nothing to do with them, including yourself. That's why Jesus told us to deny ourselves, to become his disciples. What, and well, to be honest, Christian can be easily be a, become a friend of the world without even realizing it uh, themselves. That's why we, need to, we have to so go to kingdom, church, to be around with, we get to be with other spiritual disciples to point it out in our life to humble us. All right? And discipling is definitely not of God. And when discipling is optional to you, God becomes not an option for you. But at the same time, the good news is James reminded us about God's grace. He will offer abundance of His grace on only one condition, only to the humble ones. He opposes the proud. If you have shown one of the followings, you are a prideful person. First, if, when you're being critical and grateful towards others, you're being self-reliant, being, being independent, you're being insecure and reserved, selfish, defensive, and self-flattering, unbroken and self-deceived about our sins, considered aloof and pompous. What does that mean? You're thinking better off than anyone else. Well, well, so let the Bible teach us what does it mean to be humble. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 8, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God, 
something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You have no excuse but to choose God. James chapter 4, verse 7 to 10. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the evil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Being humble is simply submitting yourself to God. God expects us to humble ourselves before Him, not wait for Him to take His turn to humble you. Well, let's look at a uh, Bible character, uh, Rehoboam. All right. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1, it reads, After Rehoboam's position as king, as um, this person is the uh, son of Solomon, as a king, was established and he had become strong. He had all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Does it sound like, does it sound like yourself? Including myself. Right? When things are going well, when we're being blessed by God, we forget about Him. And... At that time, the, uh, the king of Egypt, Shishak, has actually conquering like many lands and all the way to Jerusalem. And here's how God trying to, uh, here's how God humbled him, humbled Rehoboam. In uh, chapter five, uh, verse five, then the prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of the Judah, uh, of Judah, who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak, and he said to them, "This is what the Lord says." You have abandoned me, therefore I now abandon you to Shishak. So maybe next time you don't want to ask to be left alone when someone's confronted about your sins. <coughs> when someone actually shows genuine care for you. Like God who can just leave you be and let you take the lesson. Well, to resist the devil, as what James uh, has taught here, you need to be close with God. How do you do that? As, uh, as written here quiet times that's when we read the Bible in the morning um, and prayer F uh, have closer fellowship with the kingdom of, of course not with the friends that you like with the people who actually will hold you accountable to your sins All right? some of us are still the adorers of sentimentality that's really bad we talk about it in James chapter 2 when we talk about favoritism it doesn't help you. It sends you to hell. What areas are, uh, maybe, maybe you want to ask yourself this. What areas of your life need submission to God? Are there any sins you need to confess and repent from? For example, right, like uh, recently, I didn't even know that I need to confess when I feel self-condemned. Until I was being shown a scripture by Scotty that, no, you need to get open with that. So... Don't be shy if you don't know something that you actually, oh, I need to confess it, but I feel so bad, I didn't do it. No, you just need to be taught, you're willing to learn. Um, take time to draw near to God, knowing that He promises to draw near to you when you do so. So, we have taken enough of our free time to draw near to the devil. You should go the opposite way. True humility and repentance lead to spiritual renewal, renewal and exhortation by God. And I can totally see this from Fatah. This man actually can, he can just, before um, he became a disciple, when I studied the Bible with him, he just called us a rock. Even like when I try to pray with him to God, and he's just talking to God. I don't know what you want, man. You know, like, I feel like I'm such a joke to you. He never smiles. Like, but look at now, like, now, like, today. It's like, look at his smile with people. Right? Smile. Yeah. Yeah. But other than his smile, he's been able to connect with so many um, men here that many of us couldn't connect. Is that right way? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like uh, we tried to get away to study the Bible for a long time. Scotty, me, uh, different brothers, Metu. You think I just like, uh, like uh, so arrogant. But like, <laughs> but, 
my father just made like, such a close friendship with him. And now he's, he's just finished the Jesus study. Come on, Wei. Come on, Moving on. Point number two. Keep your eyes on your own test paper. Hey. All right. In other words, mind your own business. <laughs> James chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, he reads, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judge, judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Are you quick to judge and slander? Slander is the act of making a false or negative spoken statement about someone. That's why persecutors are scared of referencing the Bible. And even like when, when they, how, they, how they speak against a certain group of people or against the church, they use nasty languages, low character phrases. Because what they're making is false and negative. And let's look deeper into negative. Do you see being negative as just a character weakness or as a sin? The reason why many people they are unable to change is because God can be mocked. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man weeps what he sows. Not treating their sin as actual sin. Negativity is slander towards God. You need to see it this way. Just like the religious people, right? I pray in tongues and turn away like I slandered in English. Alright? Alright? You gotta deal with your sin and leave judgment to God. You're not the one to judge. Treat it as God treats it. Get rid of it radically. Focus on your own sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Therefore, I rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hip hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure, uh, pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Get open radically. Crave for the pure spiritual milk. Just for example, right? I just feel I constantly feel stupid ever since I become a disciple. That's how different things are, like in the Bible compared to the world. I'm the, I, now just every single day I feel like I'm that newborn baby, um, and I need that spiritual milk from a disciple. What? You got to always have something to work on. If you're not growing, you know, you don't have something to work on. You are falling away. I says in the Bible, in the, in that scripture. God will deal with the sinners. That's not your worries. The best way to respond uh, when someone against you is to be, simply to be blameless. And to be blameless is not simply sitting there and doing nothing. It's hard work. Philippians in chapter 2, verse 14 to 15. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without faults in a wrapped, uh, a warped and crooked nation, a generation, that you will shine among them like stars in the sky. So be blameless so God doesn't have to deal with you as well. Okay. And always remember, God's plan always supersedes ours. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are missed that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. Well, we have, we have gone through so many scriptures, the scriptures today, all right? That's uh, our feature one uh, human quote, all right? The best laid schemes of mice and men often go astray. To God, our plans are no different than the mice's. Same thing, right? When God looks down, seeing our sin, no matter how much you sin or how less you sin, we are all sinners. Right. The next, so the next time you're going to boast about what you're going to do tomorrow or next year, next month, next week, 
think about what God wants you to do first. All right. So you don't get disappointed in the end. For example, like uh, my mom, when she gave birth to me, or when she's um, about to give birth, she already like uh, she was getting excited. I was about to, you know, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's getting close to the due date, and um, she already like discussing about with her, her uh, my, my extended families, uh, you know, her friends. It's like, you know, uh, after. Uh, um, yeah, actually the due date was like the next day. And it's like, after tomorrow, we will just uh, go to this restaurant, we're gonna celebrate it. But after delivering me, um, she actually had, had like a massive bleeding due to um, uh, this thing called a drastic placental uh, atrophy. So it's, uh, anyway, she just lost lots of blood. So. Yeah, she, she, uh, she actually was in immediate uh, critical condition, and my dad has actually signed a paper to agree that you gotta be ready to decide if, um, you know, uh, who, like, if, what do you say? Uh, that you gotta be willing to be the person to, you know, let go of uh, my mom if she cannot be saved, you know? Um, yeah, so you don't know what would happen. Even though some such a good news, I was uh, I was about to be born. She didn't know what would happen afterwards. She was wanted to celebrate, but that's like a that's like a human limitation. Yeah. Uh, so you must have an unyielding faith in God's unyielding plans for you. Are you open to Lord's will for your life? Not being what you think or what your parents think it should be. All plans are arrogant. Plans if they are not of God's will. Yeah. So Jesus knows you the best. I love using this story. John chapter 5, verse 3 to 8. He had a great number of dis uh, disabled people used to lie. Uh, used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well, sir? The invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when, uh, um, when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. So many knew about this invalid man's condition, right? But no one did anything, not they could do anything. Jesus also knew, knew about the same thing, but only he could change it. Only Jesus knows you the best and can change your condition. Well, it reminds me of Keen, a story when Scotty always shared about it. You know, when he first studied the Bible with, uh, with Scotty. Because like, Keen used to be a very, like, kind of like an introverted guy, like he's pretty nervous with people and uh, with conversation as well. Let's say like this is like a table to study the Bible with, uh, I'm on, I mean, um, let's say Scotty's like, uh, like right in front of me, like with this distance, and Keen has to sit like all the way back here. <laughs> and look at him today. Lead. He's a song leader. And look at how, and look at far, how fired up he is tonight. All right? So Jesus can change you within a second when you decide to surrender yourself to him. So follow God's plan for Jesus if you want to get well. God's plans are always greater than what you think. For example, I, I, I really wanted um, a brother who, met, who actually met me on a street that brought, you, brought me along um, to, to church. Um, his name is Sean. Now he's serving in our some, uh, up, up, uh, church in up here. Um, so up on my baptism, he's already um, left. He, he actually already left uh, Auckland. So I really want him to be part of my baptism. But during that time, it was like just um, we just got off COVID, and uh, the fuel price was expensive. So the tickets were really expensive, and it was last minute. And I couldn't figure any other way. Oh, actually, I did pay for both his tickets, but ended up um, it has to be delayed, or like the time was wrong. So. There's no way I could get a refund, and I, have, I, I don't have money to buy another ticket. And guess what, next day, yeah, I knew I was gonna get the promotion, but the, I didn't just get a promotion, actually I got the back payment from the promotion from the day that I applied for it, throughout the assessment day uh, months, like it was three months of pay. And then to the day I got it, because some, something went, happened there because they delayed the process. They supposed to gave out the answer about two months earlier. Uh, 
But because of that, like they compensated our three months back pay. So I could use the money and, uh, uh, to, to pay for Sean's ticket. And there I'll simply, I just pray and just told her to surrender to God's plan. It's like, well, and because at that night when we're just like, dang, I, I, bro, I don't think you can come because I, you only got a ticket to go back, uh, which well, I would figure out how you're going to come here. But uh, then now we actually just pray on the phone. It's like, Lord, like if it can happen, it's happen. If it doesn't, I'm still going to get baptized. Uh, because any of my convictions with God, no, of Sean. So the last thing is you got to check what is missing on your test paper. You know, when you just are so confidently finishing it, uh, your exam, but you miss that one or two. And, but the qualifying mark is 100%. Right? James uh, chapter 4, verse 17, it reads, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Quite often that we're so proud of like, the sins that we do not do. I don't smoke, I don't get drunk, I don't sleep around, which is great. It's awesome. You don't commit to the sins of commission. But have you heard about a sin, uh, the sin of omission? Right? That is like you know the right thing to do, but you don't do it. Choosing not to do it, choosing to be ignored. You gotta stop being religious. Religious people will always excuse themselves, thinking God, oh God assigned all of us with different roles. So don't, I don't have to um, you know, do, go above and beyond or follow all scriptures. Well, it is true that we're, given with, we're gifted with different talents, but we are all called to get out of our comfort zones to master the unknown. And that's the only way you're going to stop yourself from sinning. Uh, I mean, un, uh, you're going to repent from your sins. Luke chapter 9, verse 22 to 24, it reads, And he said the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. We must deny ourselves to be humble, as humble is the only condition to be blessed by God. For example, um, just a while ago, that I studied with a guy, and so later on, he sent me a bunch of like a persecution articles saying that, oh, I'm not willing to study the Bible with you anymore because of this and this and that. Again, the whole reference list of like persecution article links, not a single Bible verse, but he's just saying, God assigned us to do um, you know, particular role in the church, in the body, for him. But it's like, uh, it's not necessarily for me to go evangelize. It's not necessarily for me to go out and study the Bible with people. But I just full of arrogance from there. Well, as for me, I, th I think before you got, many of you guys came to this church, uh, I was actually being pushed to be one of the song leaders by Scotty. <laughs> Well, I mean, that didn't really end well, um, but, but I still gave all my heart. You know, remember the first song I, uh, I led? I think it was like, uh, I feel good. Hey. Yeah, it was, the tone was like uh, all over the place, up and down, you know, like roller coaster. And then like uh, the next two times it went up, I got like, you know, got invited down the whole bit. Uh, but, but giving your heart pleases God. Because I know I couldn't sing. I, I knew I couldn't sing, but I knew I must give my heart. Doesn't matter how good at it or not. Well, that, uh, um, amen. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing for me, but, um, well, and it's all about what we have to do, according to the Bible. And the kingdom is the perfect training ground for you. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 5, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not ha all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though uh, many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Again, God knows you the best. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, we were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. To be victorious uh, from your battle within. It is to simply to do what you have to do 99% of the time. So you can keep what you wanted, what you decide 100% of the time. In conclusion, this lesson is called 
entitled The Battle Within. Right. So I have two challenges, or technically one challenge for each group of you. Right. If you're not a Christian, what are you waiting for? Yeah. There's never a convenient time. Yeah. God always places you in a situation where you must sacrifice something dear to you for Him. Yeah. Demonstrating your love for Him. Yeah. If you are a Christian and know what you need to change, why are you waiting? Yeah. At best, you're hurting yourself. And at worst, you are jeopardizing your chance to reach heaven and possibly hindering others from becoming Christians as well. Point number one, it's not all about you. Stop it. Point number two, keep your eyes on your own test paper. Right? For dealing with your own sin, keep your eyes away from other people's sin. It's not helpful for you. Alright? Okay. To God, uh, be all the glory. Okay.